Okay, now it's time for an interview I've really been looking forward to. I'm here with Martin Sandbu, who writes Free Lunch for the Financial Times, a daily uh, column on finance and economics. And he's also the author of Europe's Orphan. Uh, tell me a little bit about Europe's Orphan. I believe the uh, thesis of the book is that the euro itself isn't necessarily to blame for the eurozone crisis. That's right. I could have called it Europe's scapegoat instead of orphan. The idea is that the euro has been unfairly treated a bit like a foundling, unloved, getting all the blame for things that aren't actually due to the euro structure itself. So there's a conventional view out there, very widespread, that it was a badly designed currency, a disaster waiting to happen, burning house where people have thrown away the key, you know the metaphors. Uh, I think that's quite wrong. And of course there has been a crisis and terrible economic performance and political, politically poisonous relations. But all of that, this is the argument of the book, have to do with avoidable, unforced policy errors. There were alternatives. One could have, in particular, written down debts right away back in 2010, not forced so much fiscal consolidation and monetary tightening on the Eurozone as they did in 2010, 2011, and we would have been in a much better place. So taking the bad performance of the Eurozone as an argument that the euro was badly designed and it has to be fixed by much deeper integration that people don't actually know. I think that's both incorrect and also quite a dangerous view to hold. This brings us to the theme of today's conference, which is about filling in the gaps in European governance. Now, uh, the problem of the euro is basically perceived to be one of different um, economic cultures sharing the same currency. What can um, centralised regulation or planning or governance do to make that process easier? Well. I mean, there is a sense that differences are bad. I mean, that's quite different from how we have normally thought about international economics, which is that actually putting different economies together creates gains, gains from trade, for example, in trade policy. And, and I think we're a little bit too, we hurry too much to think that it's a mistake to have such different cultures and economies as Germany and Greece, for example, inside the same currency. I mean, what is clear is that the currency, the euro, created certain disciplines that didn't exist before. In particular, you can't devalue, you can't inflate your way out of debt and so on. Now, the question is, why should we think of that as a common problem rather than just a problem for the country that borrows too much and then can't pay? So I think it's been a recurrent discussion at these meetings, and it's also a theme of my book. Suppose that back in 2010, we have just said, look, Greece can't pay. It won't pay. The people who foolishly lend to it at low interest rates will have to bear the burden of that. So, you know, some of, some of what we think about now is a bit retrospective and kind of what if things could have been different. But that's still important because there's still a huge debt problem in Europe and we need to decide what to do going forward. Will there have to be more restructuring going forward? And I think there's a strong possibility that there might have be. Uh, I have to be. In hindsight, uh, don't you kind of risk um, discounting the political factors that turn nations against each other? Well, I think clearly there were political difficulties, uh, but I think that goes to underline the point I'm trying to make that the choice to bail out rather than bail in, if you like, mm. both for sovereigns and for banks, it was a political choice. It was politics, but that means that at least economically there were alternatives. So what were the politics? Well, there was, as one thing we discussed uh, at this meeting today, a kind of dilemma where there was a political promise not to do bailouts, but also a strong political aversion to writing down debt. So when you get a refinancing crisis, what do you do? Well, the politics determined the answer. There was, a, there was an unwillingness to see a Eurozone country write down its debts. But it only took two years before people finally decided, well, actually, economically and maybe politically, it makes more sense to do this. So Greek, Greece did restructure its debt and the world didn't end. The, uh, I think another way to challenge the premise of the question is to say, well, actually, it was a choice not to restructure right away that caused a lot of this political enmity, because then you set up what was a commercial transaction into a conflict between nation states, between creditor states and debtor states. Um, now, it's considered a bit rude to ask academics uh, to make predictions, but as we established in the meeting, uh, you're very much a journalist and the subtitle of your book does have the word future in it. So I thought I'd ask a little bit about your prognosis for the continent economically. You know, prognostication is, is terribly difficult and I think economists generally, one should never trust forecasts as we've seen time and time again. Economics is good for trying to understand what has happened, less good for forecasting what will happen. But since you ask, I mean, given that I have a different view of the euro than the standard view, at least, uh, I'm more optimistic because 
first of all, I don't think it's structurally doomed. So I don't think it needs big reform, fiscal union, political union in order to function. It just needs better political policy choices, which is easier, right? Because people are resisting reform. People don't want fiscal union, for example. If, if, so, something, if something isn't systemically yeah. flawed, but it's perceived to be systemically flawed, isn't that almost as bad? I mean, well, it's, uh, so long as that persists, it's, it's almost as bad. Although, if you think it's systemically flawed and nothing happens, you might start revising your views. Of course, there could be another crisis. I don't discount that. But I think I'd like to insist on the fact that there is a space, there's a possibility to make things work with the current structures. There have been changes in policy from bailout to bail-in, for example. There's less austerity. Monetary policy has finally been loosened dramatically and all of these things are having effects. Growth is slowly, slowly returning. So all of that makes me think that um, the, the the most skeptical bets against the euro are unfounded and it will probably be around for a very long time. How well it will do in terms of economic performance, very hard to say, but I think the upside is greater than it's given credit for. When you talk to policymakers, academics, um, other columnists, for instance, have we learned anything? Are you detecting I, a change of culture? I, I, think we are, I think we have learned something. Certainly meetings like this and this constant discussion of restructuring options has really moved the debate forward and also experience with restructuring Greek sovereign debt, restructuring banks in Cyprus, the new bail-in rules in Europe, all of this has made people see that, well, actually, maybe this is something we can do. And, you know, including something in the universe of possible options is quite a powerful thing. Even if you still don't like it, you think it's unlikely or difficult, at least starting to think of an option as possible makes a difference to your thinking. And I think that has happened over the last couple of years. Mm. And a unified Europe is very much worth fighting for, isn't it? Oh, certainly. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I won't keep you any longer, but thank you so much. This was really fun. Thank you. Cheers.